thanks for the invitation uh, or this or the introduction and really thank you uh Nestle Karina for inviting me to speak on this on this topic it is it's certainly uh the postbiotic is a, is a popular term it has become a popular term and I'm just happy to be part of this forum that looks like over the next couple of days have a lot of uh, timely and uh, just relevant uh, topic. So this, there's a lot going on in the, in the field. So I'll just get started here before um, before I begin, certainly put this up here that my opinions certainly aren't aren't the views of Nestle Karina Pet Care, but also not the views of uh, the University of Illinois either. They're, they're certainly mine. So if I say uh, something a little off base, that that's just me talking. So um, I wanted to put this up here first um, and then get into the really our outline of, of the talk. I want to give this a uh, uh, before we really get get into this, but um, we talk about gastrointestinal health a lot, and so really, what is gut health? I just want to say a couple comments there. Uh, touch on the microbiota a little bit, and then get into dietary strategies to modulate the gut microbes. Even before microbiome was a term, um, we've been modulating the gut microbes and knowing that the microbes are important and, and going working through the microbes um, with their, whether it's probiotics. Or, or some of the, the fibers and prebiotics or symbiotics, uh, there can be some beneficial effects on the host uh, by, by, by using those. So we'll touch on that and really lay the foundation of some of these other terms. I think it's to understand what the postbiotic term is and how that's defined and the criteria, I think it's good to, to kind of lay the foundation with these other biotics first, because it kind of builds on each other. Um, I'll go over some potential benefits and mechanisms of action. Again, there's a lot of things being learned in this area, so not everything's understood exactly, but potential mechanisms. Um, some evidence in companion animals, it's just a, a handful of studies out there right now that at least use the term, um, much more in humans, of course, and then kind of ongoing research and kind of future needs in this area, which is which is always uh, quite a bit, it seems like. So let's see, click that here. Okay, um, so from a gastrointestinal health area, I talk to people all the time about gut health. What does that really mean? Well, how do you define it? And so I kind of think about, I'm, I'm trained as a nutritionist. And so I think about this and a lot of the interventions I study are from a preventative side, kind of a, looking at a structure function claim, supporting healthy digestion, supporting a healthy immune system and, and similar similar uh, comments on that you'll see on labels. And so really if, if you think about, of course, number one for me is healthy, you know, healthy gut will, will properly digest and, and absorb nutrients. So certainly that that's very important, but the microbiota are very important as well. Um, dogs and cats aren't like, like li some livestock animals where they need a lot of energy coming from fermentation, but certainly having a resilient microbiota uh, and, and being resilient and, and stable. So if there are challenges, they can kind of resist that it is quite important. Uh, that goes along with the you know, tight barrier function, not having infections and things like that, as well as a functional immune system. So it's responding to things, but it's not over responding uh, to, to different challenges as well. So certainly that's important. Um, when it comes to ind indicators of health, especially in my research lab, where we're usually not in a clinic, we don't see diseased animals, how do you measure health in a, in a quote unquote healthy animal already? And so every animal is a little bit different, of course, but what can we measure? And so stool characteristics, the fecal scores, uh, pH certainly will, will tell you, fecal pH will tell you a little bit about how much fermentative activity and maybe what's being produced from fermentation. Uh, fecal dry matter, that's the DM there. The dry matter concentration will often, a uh, percentage will often go along with the fecal scores, but not necessarily. Uh, the fiber system in, in the diet can, can dictate that a little bit. Um, of course, digestibility of nutrients, we do that quite often. Um, if you are in a clinic or have access to intestinal samples, then certainly you can look at gut morphology and histology. Oftentimes we don't have that in our laboratory, but we do measure, oh, I can't get away from the microbiome nowadays, the microbiota, uh, different metabolites, like it was just discussed in the, in the previous uh, uh, Q&A session there, the metabolites, um, they're all probably okay, but in certain, certain dosages, they, they, they can be an imbalance and then maybe have some issues there. And then certainly some immune or inflammatory markers in, in the fecal samples as well. And then maybe response to uh, response to challenge. And that's something we've tried to do in our lab recently, where can you have a real life challenge uh, without you know, going outside the, the, the kind of ethical uh, system we have in place. And so certainly that's just a couple of things to, to build on that. And I have one more thing and then we'll get into, um, into the microbiota. But um, I think, again, if you think about the gut, what, what, is it, what does the gut do at a very basic level? Certainly it's digesting and absorbing those nutrients. It's secreting different things, whether it's for digestion or protection, uh, there's excretion of waste. But really when you Today, I'm going to mainly talk about kind of the protection side of this, that there's, you know, a constant challenge of the, of the, of the gut and potentially the host that we have, you know, a, a really one cell layer that's really kind of protecting us from everything that's in the gut. And so the immune system is certainly important. Uh, the, 
non-immune mechanisms, motility, normal motility, mucus secretions, other, other you know, acidity, of course, uh, but, but the microbes play a very important role here. So um, we know, and certainly this is a, a paper that Jan and, and, and someone else wrote here a few years ago, but I think it, it provides a nice figure that goes along with this host microbe symbiosis that it's been known for, for a very long time we're learning more about the specifics, I think, and how this relationship really uh, goes goes about. But certainly, there are a few things that the gut microbes they they certainly benefit from being uh, you know living inside the gut. But the the host will often benefit as well. So one thing is a very important thing, and being being a kind of a fiber and prebiotic person, we've I've studied that for quite a while. Is the fermentation of substrates and the metabolites that are produced from that. And so, can you support a healthy gut? Uh, a microbiota by, by providing it something in the, in, the, in the diet that won't be digested by the host, but will then reach the hindgut where most of the fermentative activity occurs and provide not only something for the gut microbes to, to consume and, and, and to live off of, but also providing byproducts that, that then the host can benefit from. So certainly energy harvest and host cell metabolism. And in this case, I'm really kind of referring to the colonocytes that are benefiting from that fermentation. Certainly, the, the gut microbes have been long known to be very important in developing the gut immune system and then maintaining that gut immunity. And again, a, a functional immune system that's not over, over responding to things that it, that, that it shouldn't be over responding to. Um, and certainly that's it, that's important. Pathogen resistance, there's several mechanisms here, certainly competing for substrates for, for energy, competing for binding sites, other signals that are being sent out and whether it's killing other bacteria or cross feeding and working with other bacteria, certainly um, this all kind of contributes to the pathogen resistance side of it. And then there's, of course, there's, there's effects beyond the gut, which I'll touch on in one slide when we talk about the mechanisms of, of action that, that postbiotics might, may, may work through. So uh, I'm not going to dwell on that too much right now. I'm going to focus mainly on the gut. That's where I guess I have the most expertise. So I'll, I'll stay there for most of the time, but um, before we move into modulating the gut microbes, and again, Dr. Sukodolsky could give a probably a much better talk on this topic than I can, but I, I did want to acknowledge, you know, how things have changed from both. I know both of us going through graduate school. Just you know, I'll say now we're old enough to say a couple decades ago now, or almost that long, that um, our view of the microbiota in the gut, not only in humans but dogs and cats, is very different. And so you know, we not that you want to throw away plating techniques because you can still do, still do a lot with those techniques, but um, the resolution and the specificity using those techniques is, is is quite different than what we have now using the DNA based techniques where you have high throughput sequencing and really have a really expanded. Um, very, very complicated genetic tree really of the dog and cat microbiota. And so um, interpretation of data is much more complicated. Uh, from a, kind of the good and the bad here, I have a, there's a cartoon here from one of the citations listed on the slide. And so the good thing is all of these microbiome projects over the last decade, if not about 15 years now, has really defined, okay, who is there and what is there at least potential to do? We don't always understand what they're doing, but certainly we know up to 5,000 different species. Not every gut is going to have 5,000 species, but certainly hundreds, if not a, you know, a thousand of different strains and things that are going to be present in the gut. Uh, and then even probably, I would argue more importantly, it's the metagenome mappability the metagenome is really the genomes of all of the microbes. What do what can they do? What genes do they have? And what you know when are they going to be active? And how will that affect the host? That's really really important. So if you look at all the genes, you know it's estimated over 300 million genes and collectively of all the microbes um, that, that exist. And so it's it's you know way way more than every host animal that maybe has around 30,000 genes. So they can do a lot. Um, one thing that's still unknown is there's still undetecteds that, you know, whether it's taxa, whether it's genes, so you can predict things with DNA using uh, techniques, but you're not going to be 100% accurate. And there'll be some things that we just don't know that what, what the gene is or what it does. And so there's still a lot to learn in this area, but it's, it's an exciting area. A lot, not surprisingly, like there's forums like this uh, because a lot is going on. One thing I did want to say too, because it comes up all the time, and I it probably like some of the questions from the previous speaker, we don't really have an answer to it, but what is normal? And this is a very uh, difficult question. And people, whether you're talking about humans or dogs and cats, what is normal in a healthy dog, healthy cat? And even defining again, what healthy is, is quite complicated. And so I serve on some advisory boards where we kind of go round and round in circles on this, but I want to do at least address the, address the, the point is that what is normal and, and, 
kind of using an analogy that so, there's many analogies that can be used for the gut microbes, but one that's often used is, is a lawn where you have an ecological system where you want richness and diversity. You want, you want something that will provide st stability and resistance if there's some kind of challenge. And then the resilience, that, that ability to bounce back to what is quote unquote normal, at least for that individual animal or person at that time after a challenge, how long does that take to get back to, 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 to what's normal? And so I think that's a kind of an important concept. And if you use this type of analogy, it's different. And you think about now, okay, in different interventions to modulate the gut microbes, there's fertilizer. So the fibers and prebiotics really kind of fit that bill. Uh, reseeding could be thought of as the probiotic. Uh, if there's completely, you know, your lawn is destroyed completely, maybe you need to resod everything. And that's more similar to a fecal transplant. And then there's preventative maintenance. So there might be vaccines and other things to kind of do that. One thing we've done, and I know I've had discussions with Dr. Sukodolsky on, on some of these things. And so not that we, there's, I don't want to call it a state of dysbiosis, but there's a lot of factors. And I, again, I focus on diet most of the time, but the animal's age, early exposures, different sources of exposures in the environment. So water, um, wildlife, whatever it might be, animals live in very different environments. Medications certainly are, are very important, not only antibiotics, but other medications that will kind of define what is normal for this individual animal. And I just want to want to think about this, that um, talking with many people and kind of seeing some of our data that not that if you feed one extreme diet, and I'm not going to say any just kibble versus raw versus something else. Um, if you feed one diet, for better or worse, the microbiome profile will look a certain way and it'll change depending on what you're feeding. And that's just from my experience. Of course, these other exposures will, will do other things as well. It doesn't necessarily mean it, it's bad or good sometimes. It's what's normal at that, at that point. And so really, I think if we're thinking about what's normal, the lawn analogy works, but it, it could be a prairie, it could be a desert, it could be a jungle, depending on all of the exposures an animal has had in the past and what they have now. And um, not, I'm not I want to say, one thing is better than the other, but I think we this what's normal is is, is pretty challenging. So um, it, again, it's a, it's a work in progress, and there's a lot of interesting uh, things going on in the in the field. But something to kind of think about there. So it, it is definitely a work in progress. Um, but even before you know, again, microbiome was even a term. This is you know, 30 years ago or roughly 30 years ago is when the prebiotic was defined, and so probiotics were known well before then. And so we've we've been studying we collectively uh, studying strategies to modulate the gut microbes for, for decades. And so, of course, probiotics is, is, is very, very popular. Live microbes, uh, di direct fed microbials is the term used often in, in livestock species, non-digestible dietary substrates. This is where I live most of the time with different fibers and prebiotics. Again, the fecal microbial transplant and then combination treatment. So again, this has been known for quite a while. We, we know more, I think we understand more of how those uh, those strategies function now than they, we did you know, a few decades ago, but still there's a lot to learn. And, but we know that these can can uh, improve health through uh, through the gut microbiota. And so, um, so of course, the, a lot of these terms initially probiotics, prebiotics, and then uh, symbiotics is kind of the combination of, of the two are, are very, very popular. And so you can just, if you go into PubMed, you can see, I mean, over 35,000 hits on, on pro, just probiotic Prebiotic, not, not as quite as popular, but uh, and symbiotic is, is, is a step below that. But I've been told is a lot of people get pro and prebiotics confused themselves. So, you know, combining the two would maybe confuse people even more. So that's that, that area isn't studied as much, but there's a lot of um, work being done in the area. Um, I serve on a few advisory boards. And one I wanted to mention here is uh, I serve on the board of directors for the International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics, or ISAP, that's the acronym. And they have many infographics. So the link at the bottom of the, of the slide here will take you to a page that has about 20 different infographics. There's not only English, but many other languages they've been translated to. But these are, whether you're a scientist, whether it's your grandma you want to explain this concept to, these are one pagers. It's it's it hits on the, the the key topics and really relates it. It kind of applies it to real life. So you can get it, get kind of lost in the definition sometimes. But these infographics are very useful. And so that's one thing that they one thing that they do. Another thing is ISAP has been very uh, important, I think, and I'm a part of the part of the part of the group now. So. I might be a little bit biased, but I do think we, we'd really take an important step in kind of defining and updating definitions that so people can, uh, again, apply it to what they're doing, whether you're a regulator, whether you're a, someone in the media, or if you're a scientist or a clinician. Um, so what they've done in the past few years, ISAP in general, as I'm talking, is with scientific advances, there was there was definitely a need for some updates with all the microbiome data and, and the new, new studies going out um, that, that 
some scientific advances, um, neat required covenant update, as well as confusion and misuse of some of the terms. So um, I served on a, two of these expert panels and in these papers, um, the prebiotic and the symbiotic paper. And I just want to kind of go give an overview of what these consensus panels uh, do and what kind of the process. So the main objective is always providing a scientifically valid approach for using the term. And the end result is that as a position paper, they've done position papers on all the biotics and a ferment, a ferment, uh, fermented foods paper. They're all in nature reviews, gastroenterology and hepatology. So high profile uh, journals, highly respected. And so th these terms carry a lot of weight. And so you have to be really careful in how you define them and, and really the criteria for meeting the terms. And so the overall process really is identifying experts. And so microbiologists, uh, gastrointest uh, gastrointestinal physiologists, nutritionists, there's others as well, immunologists often will get in here too, to really have an expert panel that where, where hopefully there's no gaps there, the, the, the knowledge base, and there's enough overlap here to say, we, we think if we come up with a, a definition, we set the criteria, it should be th something that will be accepted by, by, the, by the broader uh, scientific community. And so, um, so that, that panel is assembled and that, that's not a minor, a minor thing. And this is a big, big work that's unpaid, that there's a lot of work that goes into these. So you certainly need people that are committed and, and really, again, know the area. There's in-person presentations and discussions. And then it, the ultimate is, is a peer reviewed publication, but I have never written or rewritten a paper so much as when I, I chaired the session on symbiotics. So a lot of this, the great majority of the review is within the panel and then speaking with board, the board of directors on, on ISAP as well. So that's really extensive review process. Um, the main components include kind of the history of, of whatever term you're, you're talking about and the history of that area. The methodology used, again, assembling the panel, how, how was the paper written, how was the definition uh, come to, and everyone agreed upon it, and then that, the actual definition. And so the actual definition is important, but really I would argue these papers are more important when you read a little bit deeper. And they're not a light read, you need, you need to be focused and read these papers, but a lot of good information on the criteria. So will this qualify as, as, as a prebiotic or a probiotic? What levels of evidence are out there already? And what should be expected to, to, to really show uh, other people that yes, this, is a, this, is, this a qualifies as the term. And then really guiding principles for future research, research and development. So there's a lot of good information there on, on how to conduct the studies, what to measure and, and things like that. And then really at the end, almost always there's, there's an implication section not only for scientists, but people in the media, regulators, there's guidance all around the world. Regulations are different, but at least some guidance there, as well as people working in industry. So that's kind of an overall process of these expert consensus panels. And then I'm going to go through all the definitions here, and then we'll, we'll finish, of course, with, with postbiotics. But I want to kind of lay the foundation here first. Um, so Colin Hill led the effort. Again, you can see all these papers have a lot of uh, well-known, uh, probably none of these need introductions to anybody, well-known names, experts in the area. But they started with probiotic. And again, this was published in 2014. So the panel met a year, a year and a half before it came out. But the term really, again, I think most people know this is live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts provide a health benefit to the host. And so again, there's a few key things with every with all these terms is that one, the, the, the viability, the live microorganisms. That's a key point as we as we talk about all these terms, that's a key point. Adequate amounts, just if, it, if it's a lower uh, and then health benefit. So if the adequate, if the amount is not adequate to provide a health benefit, it, you really, by, by definition, you should not be able to call it a probiotic and any microorganism doesn't just qualify. So a lot of people kind of throw the terms around pretty loosely, but really this is the term to be called a probiotic. This is what it has to be. Prebiotic, very similar, a substrate that's selectively utilized by host microorganisms conferring a health benefit. So in this one, it's it, there are a few th key, uh, a few key th words as well. So health benefit has to be there, selectively utilized. So not just any micro, but it should be a select population, and the select population should be a beneficial population. Um, th this is still kind of a point in contention and in, in with some scientists, but I think it, I, I guess I agree with that. It should be somewhat selective, and then it's a substrate. So not substrate for the host, but this is going to be something that's non-digestible to the host, will be available to the microbiota, and then again, it'll provide this health benefit. I should have said in this previous slide, you, you can see again, 2014 publication, almost 4,000 citations. So the probiotic uh, paper has been cited uh, quite a bit. The, the similar thing in, in the prebiotic uh, definition, over 2,000 citations now. So a lot of people are reading this. Again, it applies to all species, so not just dog and cat. It's really, um, you know, of course, the human is, is the main focus for a lot of people. Uh, I chaired the symbiotic consensus panel. And so uh, again, this is a lot of work going in and now kind of 
combining, it's not just a probiotic plus a prebiotic. Conceptually, for the most part, it maybe is the, is the truth, but what we said is it's a mixture comprising live microorganisms and substrates, again, selectively utilized by host microorganisms that confer a health benefit on the host. So a lot of the same terminology, but we did want to say it, it doesn't have to be a probiotic and have to be a, a, a prebiotic. It could be if it's a substrate that's non-digestible and it, it's compared with a live microorganism, even if it hasn't been proven to be a probiotic on its own, if this combination provides a health benefit at that dose, then it, then it should be uh, classified as a symbiotic. And so that's really what the definition uh, was. And so this paper has been out a couple of years. This, this, again, this concept is a little bit more complicated than the other two individually. So there's it's still about 300 citations. So they're still being well-read. Um, and at all this time, as these, these were kind of progressively going through and updating the, the definitions, the postbiotic, um, I guess ISAP thought, you know, this should, there's, there's another group here, another, another product category that really should be updated and kind of have a, an expert panel go through the definition. So that's really where we're at now. And so ISAP, again, did, did the same thing, organized this panel. And what they, what they defined it as is a preparation of inanimate market organisms and or their components that confer a health benefit on the host. So a lot of the same terminology, the health benefit there. Um, a key thing is inanimate. So these are not dead probiotics. These are, these are purposely killed and, they're, uh, and there's different methods of doing that, but certainly that's, that's the point is they're, they're not viable. And it's, and it's not only on the, they're not on their own. There's their other, these other components, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail on, on a few slides. But even this came out last year, about a year ago. Um, and there's a couple hundred citations already. Not everyone agrees with the and is, is happy with the definition as it is, but we'll see how these evolve over time. But I, I, I guess I tend to agree with the definition. I wasn't on the panel, but uh, it makes it makes sense to me. Um, before we stop after this slide, I'm basically going to focus on the postbiotic area. But I wanted to say a couple things that uh, with all of these definitions, the health benefits again is very important, but it has to be demonstrated in the target host. So if you're interested in in a dog and a geriatric dog, you really should be you know testing the effects in a geriatric dog. So the, not only the host species, but the age and the life stage. And then also what's a, it's a big uh, point from a regulatory perspective, but also how you conduct the research is the health status of the animal. So if these are healthy animals and you're trying to support health and kind of basically, per, you can, can't say on a, on a label, you're preventing disease, but if that's really kind of the intent, then, then certainly you need to be testing a healthy population. If you're in, in dogs with IBD or some chronic enteropathy, well, then that's a totally different uh, uh, animal population um, and a totally different uh, way of thinking about things and how you design the study and what you're really dealing with. And so it really depends on what you're, what you're looking at there. Of course, the targets, most of the focus has been on the gut over for all of these biotics, but there can be non-gut targets. And there are some products out there, whether it's the skin, uh, whether it's the oral cavity, where it's the urinary tract, there's, there's other you know, niches of bacteria on the, in and on the body that could be a target of some of these products. And so again, these these definitions apply to all of those, again, if, if there's a health benefit demonstrated. Um, characterization is one thing that's a, it's a, it's very important. On the probiotic side, certainly sequencing that and, and sharing the sequence with, with everybody, uh, being be able to kind of mine that genome and see, are there, are there genes that could be a problem here, that, that there could be you know, some kind of activity that would be negative to the, to the host. So there's certainly you want to characterize that. On the prebiotic side, it's what sugars are there, what linkages are there. Um, you know, and what, what purity is there as well is very important um, of, of, this, of this product. And then if you really think about the symbiotic concept, if you know the linkages, you know the sugars, you know the, the genomes of bacteria, you can intelligently, you should at least conceptually, theoretically, in, intelligently design symbiotics that would match up a probiotic and, and this prebiotic together uh, that would, they would, again, um, kind of make music together and provide health benefits. So that, that's, uh, that's important there. Uh, on the, on the postbiotic side, it gets a little bit more, I guess the muddy, uh, the water's a little bit more muddy, that the characterization is a little bit more complicated. So uh, in the, in the paper, certainly defining it, it you know, certainly what strain of, of yeast or bacteria or fungal species is used in, in part of the fermentation. So that's, that's critical. Um, what is, you know, what's the kill step? That's, that's important. And then what is the composition at, at the end? But the, the composition of a, of a postbiotic, if you have the cells, um, you know, all these bioactives, probably hundreds or thousands of different bioactive components, um, how you define that and how you characterize it, what's really required um, is, is a little bit more gray area, at least in my, in my mind. And so uh, that's one big difference, I think, with the postbiotics versus these other biotics at the, at the moment. Um, of course, the proof of safety is required. I'd say to all researchers, if you're doing the work, 
if, if you have some safety outcomes, please report it. Uh, a lot of times when you do these assessments and people doing uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis and stuff, if it's not listed, you don't know. I mean, most of these products are safe uh, and have a, a pretty high safety margin, but if it's not stated in the paper, you, you just don't know. And so that's something that's, that's pretty important. Um, and then the last thing I want to say before I move on and just focus on postbiotics is the symbiotic term is not the same as symbiotic with an M or symbiosis. Symbiosis, again, different organisms living together. And for the most part, there's, there's benefits of living together and in this, in this environment over a long period of time. That is, that, that's symbiosis. A symbiotic, the S-Y-N, only means together. And so again, that's the matching of a microorganism and a substrate together as a symbiotic. And so I just wanted to say that. I get that question all the time and autocorrect will almost always change symbiotic to symbiotic with an M. And so you need to really be careful if you're using that term, that you're not flip-flopping them. A couple of key points of the, of the, of the, of the postbiotic uh, paper is that one, they are deliberately inactivated microbial cells. So they're not just dead probiotics and you can just sell it now as a postbiotic. They're deliberately inactivated and it's not only the microbial cells, but it's metabolites and other cell components. It's this mixture of, of well, many, again, uh, compounds and cell, cell walls and all kinds of things that are together. So that's, that's one thing. Um, a postbiotic, again, by definition, does not have to originate from a proven probiotic. It could be, as long as it's shown to have a benefit, it, it, can, it can be a postbiotic. So that's one thing. Um, all the information on the previous slide, the target population, the site of action, safety, characterization, really applies here as well. And then one thing that there's always the loopholes that when you when you set up these definitions, you try to avoid any loopholes from coming into play and people marketing on something that truly isn't really uh, doesn't meet the criteria of that definition. So one is that, that if there's purified metabolites, uh, again, microbial metabolites like butyrate or something like that, just call it butyrate is what the, what the committee has said that you don't need to market it as a postbiotic. Just call it a call it a butyrate, call it butyrate or call it short chain fatty acids or whatever you'd have um, vaccines and antibiotics, things like that are not not a postbiotic. And then one that's in the literature already. And I you just hear on marketing uh, sometimes is metabolites produced in the gut by the microbes are not a postbiotic. Just call them the metabolites that they're being produced. A postbiotic is consumed just like a probiotic is consumed. I know a similar thing occurs with probiotics. People say there's probiotics living uh, in, in, in the gut. By definition, probiotics are consumed and then they have an impact on the gut microbes and, and the host, but the probiotics aren't, aren't you, know, you, don't, you don't refer to any commensal bacteria in the gut as a probiotic. They might have beneficial properties, but again, it's not the proper use of the term and the metabolites produced in the gut are not the proper use of the, of the postbiotic term. So again, um, I'll move on to, the, to the, next, the next part here is how might these postbiotics uh, function? How might they provide benefits to the host? And so there's a, this is a very busy slide, I know. So uh, hopefully you have a, a computer screen that's big enough to kind of see these, but I'm going to go through one at a time and just give the kind of the basics here. If you think about microbes, if they're in the gut and we're, whether again, it's a probiotic that's being consumed, whether we're feeding a fiber or a prebiotic, um, you can you can somewhat you know direct and impact fermentation and really the impacts of, of that of that supplement or that or that food product. Um, with, nice thing with the postbiotic, but you don't have all 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 that control. With nice thing with the postbiotic, you, you can you can control this fermentation. Then you can provide a mixture that maybe has lactic acid, has a certain level of lactic lactic acid, short chain fatty acids. There might be bacteria sense, quorum sensing molecules, and other things that are kind of ways that microbes communicate, and those are all here. And you can, if you can dictate what the fermentation uh, uh, procedures and, and the methodology used, you can dictate then what the, what the host is gonna receive. And so one is just modulating the resident microbes by some of these uh, compounds that are already there, maybe some other signaling molecules. And so that's uh, you know, affecting the gut microbes, which we try to do with all the other biotics basically. Another one is enhancing the epithelial barrier function. And so this one, again, EPS here stands for exopolysaccharides. So these are produced by some bacteria. They can function as, as food for other bacteria, but they can have other roles as well. And so they might um, function and kind of be used for epithelial barrier function. Of course, literally for every single example here, the short chain fatty acids are gonna be there. So butyrate is very important, but acetate, propionate, some of the, the intermediates can be important there as well, but you'll see that listed on virtually everyone. Uh, the third method is really, again, targeting either the local immune system, where you can kind of see in the, in the center of the screen there, or systemic immune responses as well. So the local immune system, really we're looking at those microbe associated molecular patterns. That's the MAMP. And then uh, the, the, the pattern recognition receptors that are 
that's part of the host that are that are receiving those those signals basically from the microbes. And so this communication, whether it's toll-like receptors and different lectins, and there's different different methods here, but there's different there's that level of communication that really the microbes can communicate with the host. And so certainly that there's that local effect that can still be present in these host cells that are in the part of this post uh, postbiotic uh, mixture. Uh, the systemic immune responses can be impacted. Again, the short-chain fatty acids are there, but indole derivatives, histamine, other, other again, metabolites can have a systemic effect um, on immunity. So they can kind of act as secondary messengers, if you will, uh, to affect uh, immune system kind of large uh, globally in the body. The fourth mechanism is, is modulating, again, metabolic responses. And the previous speaker touched on, you know, the importance of bile acid. So BSH is, is the bile, uh, bile salt hydrolase. Again, there's other uh, decon... Uh, uh, methods of deconjugating and taking those the chlorine off of the, the the bile acids and affecting not only nutrition and the the, the nutrition of, of lipids but also what does that do to the microbes uh, and so that's that's one method that might uh, impact uh, systemically and metabolically the host but again short chain fatty acids vitamins and other intermediates like succinate uh, are examples here and then lastly certainly whether it's the enteric nervous system or the nervous uh, the central nervous system uh, a lot of these uh, again metabolites whether it's gaba dopamine there's a long list here as well can have an effect uh, beyond the gut and so i'm not going to go down that road that's a very complicated one to go into but certainly that's another potential mechanism by by which they might function so again it really all depends on what what you started with from a microorganism perspective what the fermentation characteristics were and what what are really what, it, what is the composition of, of, of the product afterwards. From a practical perspective, there are a lot of benefits from these products. So a new ingredient of any kind, someone's gonna ask, well, can, you, can I feed it? Is, is it allowed for use in, in foods? And so certainly a lot of them are already, the word postbiotic is not in AFCO, but a lot of uh, existing ingredients, uh, postbiotics will, will, will kind of fall underneath that. So many are already approved for use. Um, versus probiotics, one advantage of at least people kind of producing the postbiotics is the stability and shelf life. So you're inactivating these microbes on purpose. So viability is really not an issue. Certainly, you know, shelf life, there's still going to be a shelf life. You don't want these bioactive substances, whether they're degrading or, or you know, not, not being as effective long term. But certainly there is there are some advantages there, not only during the processing of different foods and, and maybe but, but the storage of food, storage of if the supplement, whatever it might be. Um, then we get into this gray area. It's kind of the good and the bad of having this mixture. So uh, intellectual property protection, if you're the company producing the postbiotic, I think there's some advantages there that there's, you know, again, tens to hundreds to thousands of different bioactives that you know what you have. Um, I guess the flip side is that maybe, you know, it, unless it's defined, you know, what, 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 is, what is this? And so we get that question all the time. We're doing research on this. It's a yeast culture. Yeah, other than that, it, it, there's, there's it, a lot of it's proprietary. So, um, so that's one, one thing is intellectual property protection, at least from the company, uh, the manufacturer side. The good thing is that, again, there's mixtures of all these bioactives. It's, you're not just targeting one little thing. You can maybe have a few mechanisms occurring and, and being really functioning from, from the previous slide, looking at, well, we have these metabolites, we have you know, the cell wall that's doing this. And so you can maybe check the boxes on a few of those things where other uh, potential interventions might not you know, check as many boxes. So that, that could be a benefit there. And then lastly, a lot of these are highly palatable. Again, if something can be, be really good, whether it's for our health or for pet health, can do a, a lot of great things, but if it's bitter or it's not palatable, it's really hard to get it into the animal. It makes it, it, makes it much more difficult. So, so that can be a benefit. I'm not gonna go into, into AFCO too much, but I didn't wanna put too much text on here, but I, I had a couple, um, I, I used a couple, the liquid fermentation product at the end is, is basically described as the dried. It's just, it's just a liquid product, but these are really the ingredients you're going to find on the label. If, if, if it's, if there's a postbiotic in the diet, this is what it's going to fall under according to AFCO. Uh, so if it's a yeast product, it's really in the yeast culture area where it's, a, again, it's a dried product. It's not only the yeast, it's the media it's been grown on and there's other, all these bioactives. So that's really where if it's going to be a yeast postbiotic, it's going to be coming in in that, in that term. If it's bacteria or fungal, it's going to either be a dried or a liquid a fermentation product. Again, again, you're culturing and then you have to you know, label lactobacillus or whatever the, whatever the strain would be on the media producing one or more of the following. So it could be just an enzyme, but this could be, if it's a postbiotic, it's going to be more, it has to be more than just the enzymes. It's going to be, again, some of those substrates that maybe aren't exhausted yet, the microbial metabolites, the, the microbial cells, all of these things are going to be part of that. So again, if it's bacteria or, or a fungal microorganism, it's going to be in those two uh, categories. 
So what is what is out there? So you, you saw the numbers a few slides ago. Again, looking at probiotics, almost you know over fifteen thousand hits. Uh, prebiotics over almost almost twelve thousand hits in PubMed. And you get to postbiotic, there's only about five hundred and some, and about half of them are in review papers. So the concept is out there, and the people are referring to them, uh, but there but there's not a lot. Um, actually research being done. The other thing is it's all very recent. So most of these are after 2019. So this term, the, the concept, I guess, of these fermentation products have been out there for quite a while, but the term postbiotic is really only a few years old, really. And so that probably uh, you know, makes make sense for some of this. But um, if you look at dog and cat, it, then you get really, really narrow and really uh, uh, only only a handful of papers here. So when if you look at postbiotic and canine, there's only 10 papers. Again, four of these 10 were mentioned in a review paper. Four are incorrectly used by just referring to clonic metabolism and the production of these metabolites and saying those are postbiotic, which is not, you know, it doesn't fit the fit the term. And there's really two dog studies. And so um, it, when you look at postbiotic and feline, there's there's a fi there's five hits and they're all you know, they, they, they are found if you look at canine as well. So there's really nothing uh, done, at least using the postbiotic term in cats to date. And so, um, again, there's a handful of studies that have been out there. Probably my relationship or my role with ISAP uh, and just me working in the gut health area, um, it's maybe not surprising that some, I'm not just trying to promote our research lab and our, our research, but this is this is the, the the few papers that have used the term and are kind of linked if you do a search. And so I'm really not gonna touch on much at all. I'm just gonna give a few details of the top three papers here. A couple of these were done in our lab. And there, again, I can just tell you there's, there's others from our lab under review. One just was accepted yesterday. So there's other things in the works here in the research community. I'm sure other people are, are working in this area as well. And we'll hopefully, if it fits the bill, we'll be using the postbiotic term and it's a little bit easier to find in, in the literature. But um, I just have a few things to say over a few of these studies and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with some summary comments and then see what questions there are in this, in this kind of new field. And so a lot of our studies, again, we have healthy, uh, healthy adult dogs and again, most of the companies coming to us, if they're ingredient suppliers, uh, we're looking for structure function claims and supporting health, not curing disease or anything like, or treating disease or anything like that. So we had healthy adult beagles, uh, 12 dogs, four by four, replicated four by four Latin square. So 12 animals over time, 28 day periods. And this was really given by gel, gel uh, capsules. Um, it's, a, it's a yeast culture at four, well, there's a placebo and then three different dosages. So we tested that. Um, the main outcomes, again, looking at digestibility, uh, fecal characteristics, and then immune cell numbers and responsiveness ex vivo. So we took immune cells and isolated those from blood samples and then tested uh, their functionality uh, in really in vitro or ex vivo. So in this uh, study, again, we saw some, what I'm calling fecal odor components. These are some of the, the protein catabolites that, again, what Dr. Sukodolsky said during the Q&A, uh, certainly there's some shifts in these metabolites. You can kind of argue, again, on the thresholds. There's not a great um, knowledge, I don't think, of what is the threshold for being you know, too much of something or too little of another thing. Uh, but certainly some of those protein catabolites were shifted a little bit in this study, uh, altered some of the microbial genera. There weren't too many, though. There were There's just a few that listed. Globally, if you look at the PCOA plots here, there's really nothing shifting. And again, most of these animals, they're healthy. It takes a lot to have them shift. They usually um, stay in the kind of the same area, the same population. It, it's really hard to kind of rock the boat on these animals, and which is a good thing that uh, certainly it wasn't these these products weren't uh, this, this, these dosages weren't weren't uh, rocking the boat too hard on this in this study. So again, no effect on digestibility, which is usually a good thing. You don't want to reduce digestibility if you know. Um, Unless, unless it's on purpose with some, some intervention. Um, fecal characteristics, again, IgA was not affected in this study. Um, there was some differences uh, in responsiveness to toll-like receptor agonists ex vivo. So we had agonists, it's, it's on the slide here on the bottom right hand of what we actually used. We have agonists that we test against TLR2, 3, and 4, and then 7 and 8 uh, TL, uh, toll like receptors. And so what we do is we isolate these white blood cells. We work in it with an immunologist here on campus and we expose them to these agnes. We incubate them for 24 hours. And then you measure TNF alpha concentrations using an ELISA kit. You can measure nitric oxide as well as another kind of readout. And so in this study, there was kind of a reduction um, in this responsiveness. And so we were talking with the immunologist and he didn't even know what the, really the study design was. And I kind of asked what, what, what was your interpretation of it? Because a lot of these assays, it really depends on the on the context of what the situation is. And so he kind of thought, well, this might be, you know, suggesting a high tolerance. It could be useful, whether it's geriatrics, whether it's animals that are, you know, prone to have inflammation or kind of an over response to certain things. And so that was our interpretation of that of that data set there that, that, that could be a benefit. Again, you can look at other data sets where maybe you'd want to stimulate 
uh, the responsiveness. And so that's just that, that's so that's one study. Another study I wasn't involved with at all. I just it, it, it popped up. And again, it's very recent. Um, again, healthy adult beagles. In this study, they had 24 dogs, a randomized crossover design with 21 day periods. Uh, but these are actually full complete diets, uh, complete balance balanced diets, a controlled diet with really no prebiotic or a postbiotic. Um, and then, then one diet was the prebiotic blend by itself. So really it had a beet pulp as a fiber and then fruct oligosaccharides, man and oligosaccharides and inulin that are, have been really, really studied. People argue whether MOS is, is really a prebiotic, but certainly it has some, some health effects and, and effects in the gut. Um, and then kelp as well. So that's kind of the, the blend that they had uh, on its own. They had this non-viable lactobacillus acidophilus uh, at 0.25%. And then the prebiotic blend plus the lactobacillus acidophilus uh, together. And so this combination, again, very similar outcomes. Again, the goal is very similar, looking at supporting digestive health. So similar outcomes in this study as, as we've conducted in our lab as well. So long story short, at least my interpretation of the data here, the main results were really on the prebiotic side, this, this prebiotic and fiber blend. Digestibility was decreased a little bit, nothing major, but it was a couple percentage units with, with protein and fat. Uh, fecal pH was reduced and dry matter percent was, was reduced a little bit as well. Looking at, again, it's changing the stool characteristics a little bit, a little bit more fermentation. I reduced uh, some of the bacteria, E. coli and fusobacterium are, are a couple of the key ones that were pulled out, and Prevotella lactobacillus firmicutes were increased. A lot of bacteria within the firmicutes phyla. So again, it, it really speaks to that uh, fermentation shift a little bit more toward the, the prebiotics and the, and the dietary fibers, uh, increased short chain fatty acids, and even at the fecal level and IgA kind of go along with that same story. Uh, the main results, again, with the non-viable lactobacillus, it appeared by itself, there wasn't really much of an effect, at least that was measured. And I always want to clarify that maybe we're not measuring the right things. Uh, not that it didn't have an effect, but at least what was measured wasn't really, didn't have a huge effect. And then the combination of the two, again, it, it kind of decreased some of those uh, fecal uh, protein catabolites, these odor components, but again, not, nothing major in that, in that study. A third study, again, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to run short on time here, so I'm going I'm to speed this up a little bit, but we had healthy English pointers and a crossover design, 16 animals. And in this case, we were looking at skin coat, uh, skin and coat measures, oxidative stress markers, and some other measures, not just fecal outcomes. And so we had a longer uh, experimental period. It was a 10-week period uh, with a, a six-week washout between uh, periods. Um, and then, it, again, I've already kind of mentioned what we measured here. Again, immune cell numbers and, and response were, were measured in this study as well. So in this one, we have different devices to measure sebum concentrations, hydration status, and epithelial uh, water loss as well. And so the, the, the change here kind of changed from baseline. There was an increase in sebum concentrations, and that kind of went along with, at least in the ear, a reduction in the, in the, uh, the amount of water that's lost with this device. And so um, and the ear was pretty consistent. On the back, there was some uh, higher variability, and that kind of seemed to contradict what the ear said. So certainly there's more work needed in this area, but it, we, we thought it was kind of, they kind of, most of the, most of the data went along together that appears that this would be a benefit um, uh, to, to the skin and coat health of these animals. But again, more work would be needed. Uh, from an oxidative stress perspective, superoxide dismutase was increased or the, the change was increased and greater in those animals uh, fed, the, fed the postbiotics. So we thought that would be, that was more protective if there would be some oxidative uh, damage, there, th this enzyme would be upregulated and kind of ready to handle that. And then there was a, the, the decrease uh, in the, the change in interferon gamma secreting T cells and cytotoxic T cells. So almost a similar uh, from thinking about from a tolerance perspective. So I know I'm, I'm, I'm getting short on time, but I want to have, have two more slides on the, on the future and kind of, I think where this area is going. Again, there's some benefits I think demonstrated a lot more is needed. Again, it, probably the term is really, really new, there's, but there's a handful of studies in dogs, uh, really no data in cats and nothing in the disease population. Again, um, I do think the impacts here might be more similar to fiber and prebiotics anyway, uh, but certainly there, there are some with the cells, uh, the yeast cells or the bacterial cell walls that could do provide some benefits uh, of the probiotics. So uh, it'd be interesting to see if, if some of these, in some of these diseased animals, if, if there would be some benefits here. Um, we have ongoing studies in our lab where we're, again, we're trying to rock the boat a little bit without with staying within the ethical parameters we have, but, you know, very realistic things that, that uh, pet owners uh, will, will see and, and kind of induce on their animals, abrupt diet change, exercise challenge, travel stress. Uh, we're in, kind of incorporated that into some of our research studies to see, can, can we see how they respond to some of these challenges? Um, and that's really the challenge that, that runs through my head a lot is how do you demonstrate efficacy in these quote unquote healthy animals where you're trying to get a structure function claim and the design, the outcome measures that are that are taken, um, can you show a benefit here? And this is done, a lot of these studies are done in humans, but there are some, you know, in the postbiotic area, 
uh, some good clinical uh, studies that have been done. And so in the, in the postbiotic paper, they have a nice table on human adults, IBS, chronic diarrhea, uh, different stressors, respiratory disease, asthma, things like that were studied and some uh, postbiotics shown to be beneficial there. And in human infants, even gastroenteritis, infectious disease and allergies, uh, preterm infants and the various issues that they have were also uh, tested in some of these studies. So certainly there is a lot of work to, to be done, but certainly th there is a foundation in humans, I think. And a lot of these products, there's a lot of data in livestock as well. I didn't put that on here, but most of the companies that come to us have already worked in swine and poultry and other animals, and now they're coming to pet. And so there are some uh, good data there. It's just to demonstrate it in the target host is, is very, very important. Um, so the last slide is just to th say thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone in my lab. Not all of them are working in the, in the, in the biotic area, but a lot of them are. This is my group, um, at least the, the grad students and postdocs. I don't have pictures of all the undergrads, but um, that, that's my group. Um, I do have my email address here if people do have questions. I know I speak really fast, and I, but the slides I'm willing to share with people, um, and I'm just happy to take any questions right now or, or at, after if there's a, a you know, Q&A session later too. But um, that, that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much.